Hey guys, Pastor Ryan here, and uh, as we continue our study through um, Pastor J.D. Greer's book, Above All, um, tonight we're going to be talking about maybe a dicey subject. Um, we're talking about the gospel above our politics. And I know from personal experience, and especially with our current circumstances in our country, the politics can be an extremely divisive topic. Um, I mean, I can remember um, as a family gathering together at my aunt's house for Thanksgiving, and there was an unspoken rule that you did not bring up politics. I mean, it was a forbidden topic amongst family. Like, that, that's how divisive I know this subject can be, is that it can even break up families. And unfortunate, unfortunately, politics has not just divided families, but it's also divided the family of God. Um, and my hope is that tonight, um, as you listen, and as we engage with Pastor J.D.'s book here, um, that we'll be mutually encouraged and pushed towards gospel unity, despite our political differences. Um, so let's get into it here. Um, towards the end of last year, um, I've gone on record um, several times, as some of you have reminded me of, um, in saying that I was not looking forward to 2020. Um, and in truth, I wasn't. And it's not because I thought that World War III was, might happen or that uh, all of Australia would catch on fire or that we'd have to deal with a global pandemic or murder hornets or racial division and riots and looting or some place called Chaz, right? Although I, you know, I didn't know those things are co were coming, although I should probably trust my gut more often than for being honest, um, but I was not looking forward to 2020 specifically because it's an election year. And I know that every time it's an election year, things get particularly nasty. Now the news is, it's always a nasty place, um, but during an election year, it gets really dirty. I mean, the uh, people just get mean. Social media becomes a nightmare. And unfortunately, that nastiness works its way into the church sometimes as well. So I was really not looking forward to another election year, which again, if you had, if you've forgotten, because of everything that's happened so far this year, if you forgot we had an election, I totally understand. But the truth is that we're going to have a presidential election in just a few months. Uh, and so, so where does the church fit in the realm of politics, right? What place does biblical truth and Christian wisdom find in the political sphere? Um, on the one hand, I believe that Christian truth permeates every area of our lives. As, uh, as Abraham Kuyper said, there is not one square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. And so we believe that, right? And that means that Christians should bring divinely informed wisdom into questions about taxation, Medicare, racial justice, global warming, and literally every other area of public, public life. And because Christians involved themselves in politics in early America, because Christians did get involved in politics, we have things like freedom of religion and, many, and freedom of speech and many other political blessings. However, because many Christians remained silent during the civil rights movement in the 1960s, the change for social justice there was much harder and slower than it needed to be. So yes, on the one hand, Christian truth belongs in every facet of the political realm, because when we speak, things happen, and when we don't speak, things happen. However, on the other hand, our speaking to a political issue could also possibly taint our gospel witness. Think of it like this. Um, think of it like trying to catch a skunk. Um, it, it, you might be able to do it. But you're probably going to get sprayed in the process. And in the end, even though you might accomplish the goal to which you set out for, you might catch the skunk, you're still going to end up stinking. We're called to be the aroma of Christ 
to those who are perishing. Do you want to be a sweet perfume or a stinky sock? And so in one sense, Christian truth must be present in our politics. And yet in doing so, we could potentially taint our gospel witness. And so for some Christians, they just want to avoid politics altogether. I mean, I know for me, I struggle with that. My preference would be to just avoid politics, to never bring it up. It's a habit that's probably ingrained deep within my mind from all those Thanksgiving dinners. <laughs> but I also know that Jesus has called us to be salt and light in our communities, and that it's necessary for me to engage in politics to impact our society. So if the gospel is above all, right, that's what we're talking about, the gospel above all. If the gospel is above all, what does that mean for our political engagement? Well, it can't mean that we just hide in our closets and avoid engaging altogether. But how do we engage in politics in a way that shows our, co our commitment is primarily to the gospel and not a particular political party or platform? How do we engage in a way that shows redemption is found not in the stars and stripes of our flag, but in the scars and stripes of our Savior? Well, I think we do so by avoiding four myths that Christians usually believe about politics. There's four myths that Christians generally believe when it comes to politics. So we're going to look at that. The first myth is this. Myth one, the gospel doesn't apply to politics. Well, as we mentioned earlier, many of the freedoms we have today came because believers applied biblical truth in the political world. So that's just, that's just not true. Um, also, when you think about our nation's earliest hospitals, universities, and educations, education systems, these were built and established by Christians. Christians in America have pioneered essentially every helping profession, including nursing and social workers. If you go further back in time, it was Christians standing in, op in opposition to infant murder and child abuse of the Romans, arguing that every person was worthy of dignity and honor. Christianity bearing out political fruit is something that our culture still needs from us. That's why um, Martin Luther King Jr. took he took his stand to say that uh, um, he took his stand against the American majority, saying that how they were treating black men and women was wrong, even though racism was at that time codified into the law, and it was supported by the majority of American citizens. Yet Dr. King said these laws, these laws violated a higher law, the Creator's law. And on that basis, he called Americans to repent. And so when our society tells us that we need to leave our Christian beliefs and values out of the political sphere, we must reply that we can't. If generations of Christians before us had, we would be living in a country with far less freedom now. So while we must speak to the politics of our day, we must also be careful to keep from going so far as to say that a particular political policy um, bears God's authority. For example, um, let's talk about it. We, we know from God's word that we must care for the poor, right? Nobody's debating that. We know from God's word, take care of the poor. We also know that God has given individual men and women the dignity and the initiative and the responsibility to provide for themselves. As a church, we can and should teach both of these principles. But how well does one particular political policy balance these two biblical truths? Well, in most cases, the answer to these questions goes beyond the church's teaching capacity. It becomes no longer a matter of, of, a, of applying clear biblical teaching, but now it's a matter of applying wisdom. And while God's Word does provide wisdom that is applicable in every area to every issue in life, it does not speak with equal clarity on which current strategy best addresses each issue, right? When it comes to things like empowerment for the poor, 
um, the best strategies to address racial injustice or the most responsible ways to steward the environment. Christians in the same church, Christians even in the same small group, should be able to come to different conclusions and still experience unity in Christ. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't think through the issues and be informed. It doesn't mean that every person's viewpoint is going to be equally correct. They're not. Some policies are destructive. Some are corrupt. Some need to be exposed for the common good. And you should feel free to argue your convictions on the above. But not in a way that implies you have the authority of God behind you. We should be able to disagree on these things while at the same time not questioning the spirituality or salvation of those who th see things differently than us. The dividing line in our churches should not be between Democrats and Republicans. The dividing line should be between the stra it, it shouldn't be between the, the strategies used to address the issues, but rather the issues themselves. Do you care about uh, issues of justice, of righteousness, of fairness, of compassion, or don't you? Just because someone doesn't agree with your particular strategy to resolve those issues doesn't mean that they don't care about those issues. Gospel truth is necessary in our politics, but it has to be, accom it has to be accompanied by gospel grace and gospel humility. So uh, that was myth one. Myth two, secondary ideals are matters of first importance. Myth two says that secondary ideals are matters of first importance. And, and while some people, we talked about in myth one, some people think the gospel has no place in our politics, others make the mistake of believing that our political ideals and platforms are of the most importance. Um, for instance, I know many Christians who, who have said, if you don't agree with me on this particular political issue, we can't be friends. I mean, if you don't agree with me on this, we can't, we can't fellowship together. And practically speaking, if that's you, if you're someone who says that, then really what you're saying is that you feel more connected with other people who share your political beliefs than you do with those who share your faith in Christ. That's a problem. If, if that's true about us, then the gospel is certainly not above all in our hearts. As Christians, we should feel a greater unity in Christ than we do a disunity in our political strategies. And another reason we should be more humble and less dogmatic in our political, conviction, uh, political convictions is because we might be wrong. <laughs> Policy matters always seem so clear to us in the moment. And yet, even those of us who are informed can't see every possible angle or every possibility. And we may look back in a few years and realize that we were dead wrong, or that the positions we held back then were slightly off. Right? I might be wrong about the best way to fix our national debt, or, or, the best, or what's the most effective strategy to help our homeless. I might be wrong about those things, but I'm not wrong about the gospel. So if I speak about political matters with the same authority that I speak about gospel matters in the Word of God, then I shouldn't be surprised when my gospel witness and platform seems to get weaker and it seems to diminish. Again, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't have your own political convictions. You absolutely should, and you should believe your convictions are right. Please, if you don't believe your convictions are right, Change them. I don't want you to hold the convictions that you think are wrong. But hopefully, as we're thinking through and de developing and forming our political convictions, hopefully we can have enough humility to admit that our political perspective does not have 2020 vision. And we might be wrong in some areas, but we can all have confidence that we see the gospel clearly. I never want my opinions on politics to prevent people from hearing the gospel. And again, the problem is not just that you might be wrong in your political views, but even if you are right, and you're 100% positive you're right, politics is simply not 
as important as the gospel. We have one primary message, the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel. As a church, we should be a place where people from polar opposites on the political spectrum can come together in unity in Christ. Even Jesus dealt with political drama uh, amongst the 12 disciples. I mean, one of Jesus' disciples was Simon the Zealot, and another was Matthew the tax collector. Well, the Zealots were a group of Jews that thought Judaism should revolt against Rome, and they sought to drive out all Roman influence. Tax collectors, on the other hand, worked for Rome, so they represented the establishment. These two groups had some pretty deep-seated political disagreements. One thought war with Rome was the answer and the best course of action. The other thought complicity with Rome was wiser. And I'm sure Simon and Matthew had some really interesting conversations sitting around the campfire. But at the end of the day, they found in their love for Jesus a unity that was greater than the political matters that divided them. I pray it would be the same for us in our churches as well. That was myth two. Myth three. Myth three, there is never a time to take a controversial political stand. That's it. Myth three says that there's never a time for the church or believers to take a controversial political stand. So again, on the one hand, uh, we want to see Christian truth influence every aspect of our society. But on the other hand, we don't want to get... Uh, allow secondary issues to distract and compromise our ability to fulfill our primary gospel mission. So the question is, is there ever a time for the church to take a political stand? When is speaking about a political issue a matter of gospel faithfulness or a distraction from the gospel? And as we read through scripture, what we see is that there are many calls for God's people to rebuke evil. Read through the prophets. God he constantly calls out injustices towards children, women, laborers, employers, the outcasts, the poor, the voiceless. The prophets never get tired of putting Israel on blast about personal moral evil as well, particularly when it comes to their sexual immorality. The prophets trumpet a call for God's justice. But calls for justice without specific steps to fix the injustice, which is what we see a lot of today in the news, are little more than sentiment. They don't, they don't really help anything. When we think about men like William Wilberforce and Martin Luther King Jr., men who fought against slavery and racial injustice, they frequently quoted from prophetic books like Amos, inspiring and calling our society to turn to justice. However, they also rightly followed up this preaching for justice by calling on their governments to institute measures to fix the injustice. They didn't just point the problem out, but they helped provide the solution. John the Baptist calls out Herod for sleeping with his brother's wife. Well, that ended up in John being executed. I'm sure if John was alive today, um, there would have been Christians saying, hey, come on, man. Just stick to the spiritual stuff, John. Um, stop commenting on public sexuality. But what did Jesus say about John's ministry? Matthew 11, 11, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. The truth is that the church has often failed to speak as directly and as specifically as we should in the realm of politics. Um, especially concerning issues of injustice and morality. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer felt the same way about the German church during the 1930s. Um, during the 1930s, the German church in his generation was content to simply say, discrimination is wrong. And you know what? The Nazi party was okay with that. They were okay with that statement, as long as it stayed there. 
You know, they were okay with the church saying discrimination is wrong. However, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the confessing church knew that obedience to God's word required them to take a step further. Obedience required for them to get their hands dirty by not just saying discrimination is wrong, but because of this, we must oppose the Nazis. Well, like John the Baptist, Dietrich Bonhoeffer paid for his rebuke with his life. Far too many churches today are silent about the wickedness in our society. They're silent about the wickedness on issues of abortion, the sanctity of marriage, and many other things that we've failed to address. And we must address these things. Yet we also must find a balance in speaking too frequently to politics. Think about Jesus' ministry. Throughout his ministry here, Jesus showed a remarkable restraint from getting involved in political and social causes. I mean, after he fed the 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish, what did the people want to do? They wanted to make him king. So where did Jesus go? He ran away into the mountains. <laughs> he ran away from the people, and then he came back later. And guess what he did when he came back? He preached the gospel. He ran away, came back, preaching the gospel. Even the prospect of ending world hunger for Jesus was a secondary issue to preaching the gospel. Think about Paul. Paul didn't spend many, uh, he didn't spend much of his time addressing the many societal problems of the Romans. Instead, he focused on spreading the gospel and planting churches. In his letters, he didn't call believers to particular uh, political policy or points of, of political interest. Instead, he opposed core issues of discrimination and injustice. And these core issues, these core principles, would inject into the churches he was speaking to the seeds that would ultimately grow up into removing these societal evils. The principles from Paul's letters can be applied to our political world. And that's the point. Paul taught his churches the principles of the kingdom, but he stopped short from applying them to the specific political realm. He allowed individual believers in those churches, as they were led by the Holy Spirit, to make that application. Believers should permeate every part of society. I mean, we should be bringing scripture-shaped, gospel-infused wisdom wherever we go. And we want Christians to be everywhere. We want Christians to be influencing business and education and health care and stewardship of the earth and tax policies and trade and everything else in between. That's what it looks like for Christians to be salt and light in the world. And so this means that we also want to see Christians as individuals more involved in politics, not less. However, we also need to keep our priorities straight. The church, the body of Christ, is the only organization that Jesus gave the responsibility and the mission of the gospel. We are plan A. There is no plan B. We're the only method Jesus has prescribed to see disciples multiply to the ends of the earth. Think about it like this. Um, if you're an EMT and you show up at the site of an earthquake, you're not going to be serving others well if you roll up your sleeves and start hauling away debris, or if you, you grab a crying little girl and help her find her lost puppy. Those are, those are important tasks. Those are things that need to be done. But as you are one of the only people trained in emergency care, that's what you should be focusing on. That's the reason you were called to the site. Sometimes good things can take us away from the one thing that God has tasked us with. The gospel. I love what Christopher Wright says. He says, God does not have a set of missions for his church. He formed a church for his mission. There's one mission. We don't want to get distracted by everything else. But then again, there are times when the church can and should speak out. The church was wrong to sit on the sidelines during the civil rights movement, saying it's a political matter, not a gospel one. If we fail to speak out where we should, 
others will be harmed by our silence. So we must ask God to give us the wisdom and to lead us by His Spirit to show us when and how we should speak out. And myth four, myth four is this, we see everything clearly. That's myth four. Myth four says we see everything clearly. And the reality is that any Christian, regardless of how popular they are, how many degrees they have, how much God has accomplished through them, any Christian can be wrong. Some of our greatest theological heroes have said some terrible things. I love Martin Luther. Go read his thoughts on the Jews. Right? The most important thing we should take away from the mistakes of our heroes in the past is an attitude and a posture of humility in the presence. We should be able to say, if even these great brothers and sisters in Christ, if even these great heroes of the faith got some things wrong, then I'd be a fool to think that I have everything right. right? This, again, this doesn't mean that we stop applying gospel wisdom to politics or that we shouldn't develop firm convictions. Each of us is responsible to search out Scripture diligently, to pray for wisdom, and then to ask God to lead us in applying His wisdom the best way we know how. But as we seek to walk the path of gospel wisdom, we must have humility and allow sometimes for correction and redirection. The, the, the chances are that those on the political right have something to learn from those on the political left. And those on the left have something to learn from those on the right. Neither one sees everything clearly. Again, this doesn't mean that both of them are equally right. Just, just because they both have something to learn from each other doesn't mean that both of them are equally right. But it just means that together we can seek the scriptures and apply the gospel better as we learn from each other. So in wrapping all this up, as Christians, our primary charge is not to transform political structures, but to make disciples of all people. We should proclaim biblical values and advocate for justice. We should watch out for the poor. But like the apostles in Jesus, we need to show restraint in how much focus we put on these issues. Our gospel mission is too important. So when scripture does not draw a direct line to a particular policy, we should be very cautious in doing so. The church alone has been given the commission to invite men and women into gospel life. The one thing Jesus told uh, us to do was not to march on Rome or Washington, D.C., but to bring the gospel to Jerusalem, to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. If we allow the gospel to reign above our politics, we have an opportunity to show our society something that they are desperately longing to see, we get to show them a body of men and women who stand united even in the midst of differing political perspectives. That can only happen when we see the thing uniting us as bigger, greater, better, and above all that divides us. If the church in our demonstration, uh, our generation can demonstrate unity in the gospel that overcomes even our divisions in politics, I promise you, we're going to shine like a city on a hill. And by God's grace, Jesus will draw many to him in faith. God, may we never take our eyes off of our primary commission to preach the gospel. So I love you guys. Um, I'm here for you. Um, Y'all be praying for us as uh, we're, Emily should hopefully be uh, going into labor. Well, actually, by the time you're watching this, hopefully we'll already have a new baby boy. So y'all just be praying for us and uh, excited to see y'all and get together again soon. So y'all take care. God bless.